Okay, I see the numbers sort of settling. So I'll go ahead and jump right into our housekeeping stuff. So welcome back to the Collaborative Science Restory Series. This is Nick Sobral with the Science Collaborative. Today's webinar features some members from a Catalyst project called Experimenting with Elevation, which explored management options for wetland elevation maintenance. And you'll get to hear from them shortly, but I've got a couple of housekeeping things to jump through first. So this project, which started in 2020, brought together land managers and regional scientists to share their restoration experiences and identify wetland restoration priorities, pilot sites, and techniques for use within GTM Reserve in Florida. And I'll give you a little bit of background on the science collaborative here in the webinar series and the reserve system. So the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is a national network of unique research reserves as shown on this map. This is a NOAA program that works in collaboration with a local place-based partner, either a state agency, university, or nonprofit. Each reserve site includes programs focused on land stewardship, research and scientific monitoring, training programs for the public and local officials, and education. The Science Collaborative supports science for estuarine and coastal decision makers by coordinating regular funding opportunities opportunities and supporting user-driven collaborative research assessment and transfer activities that address critical coastal management needs identified by the reserves. The webinar series features project teams supported by the Science Collaborative, program staff, and partners. And speakers share their unique approaches to addressing current coastal and estuarine management issues. And if that sounds interesting to you, please do join us for future webinars to learn more about new methods to integrate technical experts and users of project outputs into the research process and how the research results and products might inform your own work. So some quick housekeeping stuff. All attendees are read on entry. We'll be handling the Q&A via Zoom's Q&A feature. Chat is open to everyone, so you can chat to us. You can chat to other attendees as well. Um, you can just enter questions as they occur to you throughout the webinar. So. No need to be shy, and we'll leave time for Q&A at the end. So with that, let me introduce our speakers for today. And we've got Samantha Chapman, who is the co-director of, of the Center for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Stewardship at Villanova University, and she leads the Wet Feed Project, which she'll say more about. Tess Adji is the laboratory manager at the Chapman Langley Lab at Villanova University, where she helps to organize, analyze, and apply experimental and spatial data to inform restoration and conservation projects. And Caitlin Dietz is the collaboration coordinator of the GTM Reserve, where she helps to translate science into application and action. And I believe, Sam, you are up first at screen share, so I'll stop mine so you can jump in. Yep, will do, Nick. Great. Take it away. I saw closed captioning, so awesome. So um, thanks so much to Nick and Jane and Jen for um, having us do this webinar. Um, Tess and Caitlin and I are really excited about it. I've enjoyed the series of webinars since I've been involved with the Neuroscience Collaborative. Um, and I think the way that we're going to approach this today is to actually give you sort of a chronological approach in the way that we've conducted um, this research project through a, a Catalyst grant through the Neuroscience Collaborative. And I think that that hopefully will be helpful for you. Um, I always like to hear about how people got their ideas, executed them, and sort of learned from them. And so hopefully that'll be helpful for you as well. Um, so I wanted to sort of give you a little bit of information on the origins of this project. So in a, in a minute, I'm going to show you some data and results that we got from some modeling exercises we've been doing as part of the NSF-funded wet feet project that I run. And Nikki Dix and I, who's the research director at the GTM Research Reserve, and I were, you know, standing at a coffee break at a conference and talking about some of those results. And we just sort of started talking about, well, what are we going to do with this information, right? Knowing what we know about the fate of some of the wetlands within the reserve um, in, the, in the face of sea level rise, you know, what can we do about this in terms of restoration, in terms of conservation, and how will we know where to do these things and with whom to talk about to get the expertise um, needed to restore and conserve some of these places. And so that really um, was the catalyst for this catalyst grant that we wrote um, with us at Villanova, as well as our partners at the GTM Research Reserve. And it's really been a fun project. I've been working um, with Caitlin and Nikki and many others at the reserve over the past five years, and it's truly a joy. You know, I really feel like I found my research home and I love working there. Um, and trying to understand these amazing places, even though we're up here in Philadelphia. <laughs> um, so what I wanna tell you about first are these data um, that we based this project on. And so 
as part of this wet feet project, we have been looking at the below ground forces that are shaping wetland elevations. So root growth, sediment deposition, um, decomposition of organic matter and other forces, which are all really important in determining how wetlands build elevation and keep peace pace with sea level. Um, so in that project, we've done a lot of field experimentation, as well as monitoring and measurements of elevation, as well as these other parameters that contribute to elevation. We've also been collecting lots of other physical inputs and other um, parameters from around the reserve, which of course has amazing data sets like through swamp data and other things to help parameterize this model that we've been working on in collaboration with Jim Morris. And any of you may be familiar with Jim's MEM model, the Marsh Equilibrium model, which is a temporal model, um, not spatially explicit in the way that we're using it to assess how well uh, wetlands will keep pace with sea level rise in terms of their standing biomass, in terms of their elevation, and in terms of their carbon sequestration. Oh, sorry. And so what we did um, with this MEM model was we actually were able to parameterize it for mangroves in addition to marshes. And the reason that we wanted to do that is that in the GTM reserve, there is increasingly a presence of mangroves as the reserve is really perched right at the ecotome between where salt marshes dominate to the higher latitudes and to the north in this case, and mangroves dominate to the south. And so there's been an increasing abundance of mangroves in the reserve, which is really interesting for all kinds of reasons. Um, but one of the reasons it's most interesting perhaps is the way that both marshes and mangroves build elevation. And so we were able to work with Jim who reparameterized and really rebuilt his whole model, um, the, the MEM model to become the QEM model, which is now the coastal wetland equilibrium model to model not just marshes and the way they build elevation, but also mangroves as well. And so what you see here in these bottom three panels are three different outputs from that model at a 40 centimeter sea level rise scenario, a 60 centimeter sea level rise scenario, and a 100 centimeter sea level rise scenario. And the different colored lines here are blue are juvenile Abyssinia germinans, which is the black mangrove, and that's the species of mangroves that tends to be most dominant in encroaching into the reserve marshes. Um, the black line is mature mangrove, and the red line is spartina alternative floor, which is the dominant marsh grass at the reserve. And the dashed blue line is the mean sea level in each of these scenarios. And you can see that we've run this model out over 100 years. So the main take homes from what we found is that at a 40 centimeter sea level rise scenario, most of these wetlands are building elevation. As you can see, elevations on the y axis there, they're building elevation. Um, fine and will likely be able to keep up with rising seas at least 100 years out. But in both the 60 centimeter and the 100 centimeter sea level rise scenarios, we see that both um, salt marshes and mangroves start to decline in elevation. But a really important take home from these modeling results is that mangroves are building elevation more effectively than the marshes in these situations. We actually have field data from another site where we've seen the same thing, where we've measured elevation with SETs over time. Um, and the same thing we're actually finding, and this will be coming out in a paper hopefully soon, um, about what, what we're seeing at the reserve, that mangroves are building elevation more quickly than marshes are in, in a given similar scenario, hydrologically and otherwise. And so this, again, brought us to the question, but Nikki and I talked about at this conference, like, well, what do we do about this, right? What do we do about the fact that we temporarily know that a lot of these wetlands are going to be underwater in a number of years? And I know many of you are, of course, thinking about that as well. Um, what can we think about this in sort of a spatially explicit context? And so that brought us to write this proposal. Um, and to do so, we had two major goals. So the first goal of the Experimenting with Elevation project, project was to identify portions of the reserve that are particularly vulnerable to habitat loss. So, you know, as I said, the QEM model was temporally explicit, you know, thinking into the future. This is more thinking about things in a spatial context. Of course, these are the places that 
are managed for habitat, are managed for recreation, are managed for all kinds of um, different ecosystem services that the reserve is providing for local residents in Northeast Florida. And so we needed to know which portions of the reserve were most vulnerable. Um, there are many end users and stakeholders we worked with on this project, including, of course, the GTM managers and staff, but also people from the aquatic preserves, the Army Corps, um, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, North Florida Land Trust, county land managers, and in particular, the St. John's Water Management District, from whom we gained some layers for our model, as well as actually worked with and learned a lot about restoration. Um, and so our approach for this first goal was to actually build this coastal vulnerability index, which is a product that comes out of the Natural Capital Project. Um, and use that with stakeholder discussions and field elevation measurements to figure out which places in the reserve are most vulnerable. And so we were able to do this using this coastal vulnerability index model, which has a number of layers that many of you are familiar with, including things like wave exposure, elevation, which is of course one of the parameters that you know, we want to maximize in order to keep up with sea level rise and big storms surge potentials, the geomorphology of these, as well as the natural habitats. And so the habitat layer here, we had to sort of build and construct um, ourselves because it's so dynamic, um, because mangroves are increasingly encroaching into the salt marshes. And it's important to know where are the mangroves and where are the marshes. Um, and so with this model, we can do things. And really, I should say that this model was really um, built by Greg Verutes, our collaborator on this project. And this um, work by Greg is gonna be featured hopefully in a manuscript that we're about to submit. And so I'll um, be sure to post that on the, the Neuroscience Collaborative webpage when it comes out. Um, and so what we're able to do with this, in addition to actually spatially identifying sites that are more and less vulnerable, is actually look at the roles of habitats. So you can see here three different sections of the reserve. And the places that are more red are the most vulnerable. This is an index, right? So scores are relative to each other for space um, along the coastlines of the reserve. Um, and so you can see without habitats, these are the places that are most vulnerable. If we put those habitats back in, we can see the role that they really play in different sections of the reserve. And so you can perhaps imagine why this would be so useful for management, because we can say, oh, this place here, which is like light blue, habitat is playing an important role in, in protecting against storm surges and against erosion. But perhaps we need to look at that spot as a potential target for restoration or conservation. And so this brings us to the second goal of the project, which I'll, I'll admit is really a stretch for me. Um, I'm an experimental scientist and ecosystem ecologist. And so I am very grateful to have collaborators like Caitlin to teach me about how to do collaborative science with stakeholders and to you know, do science that matters in this kind of management context. And so um, that's where this grant has really been an amazing adventure for us because we've learned so much about this. Um, and so with this grant, we were able to plan two workshops, which we'll tell you about again in a chronological way today, um, that bring together a unique regional team to engage in this communal restoration planning. And so this is, I have to admit, another area which I don't know much about, which is restoration. And so I'm grateful to collaborators and colleagues on this project, like Ron Brockmeyer, Nan Roddenberry, who've taken me out and showed me some of their really cool um, restoration projects that they've done in Northeast Florida. And so the four strategies that we were looking at in this Catalyst grant were mangrove establishment, which is a strategy for restoration, but it's also sort of something that's happening, right? This idea that mangroves are encroaching naturally into these um, marshes and are increasing in abundance because of the lack of freeze events, although recent events and my um, collaborators down there are looking at that intensely, particularly up in Timucuan and other parts of Northeast Florida, um, these recent freeze events might have some interesting impacts on that. So mangroves, as I said, do tend to build elevation more rapidly. And so that's one restoration strategy. Another that many of you are very familiar with are living shorelines. Another is landform modification. And we'll talk more about that later in the webinar today. Um, and then another is the layer sediment deposition. And so our collaborators at the US Army Corps have been really um, important in helping us understand, you know, the importance of thin layer placement and how it's been done in other projects and is potentially able to be done in, in, um, in wetlands like these. And so 
before we were able to actually achieve these two workshops, Tess and I and Caitlin um, wanted to put out a survey, which Tess is going to tell you about in a second, um, and to have kind of individual discussions and interviews with all of the various stakeholders on this project. And those are really helpful. And as I'm sure many of you who have done these kinds of projects know, you know, these one-on-one -on -one conversations about what kind of restoration have people worked on? What's their knowledge about it? Have been really important um, in our understanding of knowing where all the participants for these workshops are coming from before we actually go through with the workshops. And so now Tess will tell you a little bit about the survey that we gave before our work first workshop. Mm -hmm. So this uh, initial stakeholder survey that we sent out, uh, we came up with this in, I believe it was the fall of 2020. So the depths of the pandemic. Uh, we were really excited to talk to other people, as I'm sure any of you can relate to at that time. Um, so we sent out um, these stakeholder surveys in January of 2021, really with the intent of gauging our stakeholders and their level of experience with each of these four restoration strategies that Sam just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and if you'll notice in the figure on the right hand side, um, our survey had a number of really targeted questions. So uh, yes, I did do a project that involved mangrove establishment or no, I did not do a project that involved mangrove establishment. And our results um, really surprised us because we fully expected that these restoration practitioners would be experts in these different strategies. But turns out um, living shorelines aside, which are widely used in Florida and then across many other wetland uh, areas as well, there wasn't as much experience in these different restoration techniques as we had initially expected, which definitely threw us for a loop, um, but we just kind of had to retool a little bit and further explore this in our follow-up interviews. So after we uh, received these results from our stakeholders, we followed up with a really informal Zoom call just to kind of A, get to know them, because we didn't really know a lot of these stakeholders, these people who do restoration actively or know more about it than we do for sure. Um, but also to um, really explore what they said in their surveys in a little bit more depth, right? And a number of themes uh, kept popping up in our different conversations with our stakeholders that were pretty consistent across all of the different interviews that we had. Um, the first of which was this definite need for science-informed practice, which I think is where some of this um, gray area of different knowledge about different restoration techniques comes into play, right? all of our stakeholders had the same thing to say, right? There's just not a lot of research on these different techniques, where they work, where they're feasible, and then also how successful they can be. Um, so if the, or if the information is out there, it's not, you know, collated in a specific area, but that's easy for restoration practitioners to find. Um, we also, another theme that came up was data and resource availability, which is pretty similar to this need for science informed practice, right? who is doing what project and where are they doing it? Who are the people with the experience? Um, how do I get their number? What are their emails? Like, I don't know. Um, and then lastly, another theme that was really surprising to us, again, experimentalists, not really used to di diving into this sort of sociology aspect of things, but um, time and time again, our stakeholders kept bringing up that public perception in these restoration projects was really, really integral to their success whether that be uh, in long-term restoration projects where maybe an area doesn't look super nice for a really long time, that doesn't bode well with the public, right? If a mangrove isn't gonna look like a really pretty mangrove, people don't really wanna see it, right? So we also kept on talking about how the public involvement and engagement in restoration projects really can uh, make or break them. And again, these survey results and interviews didn't really go the way that we expected them to. Um, but they really helped us identify knowledge gaps in these restoration strategies and helped us retool and sort of really think through the uh, workshops in a way that would be more uh, fitting for our stakeholders and for the GTM, which uh, Caitlin's going to tell you a little bit about. And I'll quickly just add, you know, hearing both Sam and Tess talk about this project, they both really do have that whole collaborative mindset um, as they've been going through. So I give them both kudos for thinking through what our stakeholders and what our end users are sharing with them, um, especially when designing the time that we were spending together. Um, so we kicked off the project after those surveys in um, 
virtual conversations with our stakeholders in February of 2021 um, in a two-part virtual workshop. Um, at this point in time, we were still doing virtual workshops, um, so we had to adapt our project a little bit. Um, but in those virtual workshops, we had stakeholders, as Sam mentioned, from our local water management district and land trust, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and the Army Corps of Engineers, and several local universities. Um, and to kick it all off, because this was the first time that we had all been together in one space, we started it off with a word cloud activity. Um, Something very simple as an icebreaker, just to give the attendees a chance to share their initial perspective of restoration. Um, so that way, as a group, we could see where everyone was coming from, where expertise was, challenges, concerns. Um, as you can see in this word cloud, um, some of the some of the words that surprised me. Um, when asking about restoration included job security and permitting and communication and expenses and those are things that you might not necessarily think of if you're coming from the restoration perspective but if you are coming from the permitting agency or a funder those are definite concerns that you have or things that you want to be aware of when you're talking about um, restoration activities. Um, and it was at this workshop that Sam and Tess um, kind of gave a summary of those surveys and those conversations that were initially shared. And we really used those conversations and surveys to design this first virtual workshop. Um, in in addition to those presentations, we heard restoration stories from Northeast Florida, um, and we had selected specific end users um, who were identified through those interviews who shared successful restoration projects. Um, they shared resources, manuals, videos, and even guidance on how different techniques were used. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission um, Actually, Sam, if you want to go to the next slide so we can see everyone's faces. Thanks. Um, they shared a salt marsh restoration project at um, a local marine discovery center that now serves as a shoreline stabilization and demonstration area um, for visitors and restoration practitioners. And that site showcases a variety of restoration techniques, such as terracing with vegetation, um, a retaining wall, a seawall, a seawall with riprap. Um, and that restoration practitioner from FWC also shared how that site is monitored with the assistance of several partners in the area and citizen scientists. Another representative from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation shared about a training manual and video that gave instructions um, on how a specific restoration project was monitored and recommendations on how restoration projects could be monitored throughout the entire state of Florida. So that way there is consistency in monitoring efforts. Um, our representative from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers presented on a thin layer placement project, or um, as he referred to it as a sediment beneficial use project um, in the Intracoastal Waterway up in South Georgia. And that restoration story highlighted beginning to end the project design, the surveying, the coordination efforts, the construction and outreach and the monitoring that had to take place. Um, and the presenter or the uh, representative from the Army Corps was very honest with the lessons um, that they learned in that process, um, the challenges that they might have had, whether it was getting equipment out to a site or what it looked, what the site looked like after the um, initial restoration effort. Um, and local water management district representatives shared about a mosquito ditching restoration project that had heightened awareness from the public. Um, and they shared how, how they dealt with the public perception of uh, the restoration effort and the challenges that they might have had. And then we had a final presenter from the University of Florida who shared about a um, 
the planning for restoration and the processes of working through and with both the public and private sectors, as well as academia, and a project that was actually kind of going along in the same uh, timeline as this experimenting with elevation project, but focusing specifically on thin layer placement. Um, and so the ability to hear successful stories um, with the honesty and total transparency of what works, what didn't work was really great. And I think this initial day one workshop allowed the project team to really form a collaborative team of scientists and land managers here in Northeast Florida and really foster those relationships um, across the region. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, this workshop was a two day one, I think I mentioned. And so a portion of the workshop also highlighted that CVI that Sam, Sam mentioned, um, Greg developed, where the, it was a tool that we could use to indicate where exposed or vulnerable sites within the reserve were to help us assess that role that the natural habitat played and help us prioritize that for protection. And so on the first day of the workshop, Greg gave an overview of that tool to our stakeholders. And then on the next slide, you'll see a homework assignment that um, Tess and Greg created. Um, for the stakeholders to take home a worksheet and it encouraged them to explore the CVI viewer online, um, kind of go into the areas and on the tool that they knew um, the characteristics of that they're in um, to see, is this really a vulnerable site based on the tool? Kind of do some ground truthing um, through their computer and their experience. Um, and then on the second day of the workshop, Greg shared the data sources of those variables that were included in the model, um, where it was pulled from, why, he, um, why they were pulled into the CVI. Um, and then the stakeholders discussed how this model could be used in other areas. I think I saw a question in the Q&A box, you know, were you able to evaluate areas outside of the reserve? For this specific project, we focused on the reserve boundaries, but there is an opportunity, you know, to use this model in other areas. Um, and I'm going to actually pass it over to Tess to give a little bit more information about the CVI and um, that homework assignment. Thanks, Caitlin. So the CVI, um, there's far more detail about the CVI in this paper that Sam mentioned uh, by Greg Baruch as it's in prep right now. Hopefully it will be submitted relatively soon. Um, so if you want to get really into the nitty gritty about GIS modeling, um, data layering and how each uh, variable impacted uh, our rating of coastal exposure. Um, you can definitely check that out. We will post that as soon as it's fully published. Um, it's a really, really interesting insight and a really creative way to assess coastal vulnerability and coastal exposure um, within a sort of a determined boundary. And um, sort of in between workshops, as a result of workshops, and then, uh, continually over time, we have been working on the layers that feed into the CVI, as well as incorporating expert opinion from that homework assignment directly into the model output. So a quick aside here too, I keep saying model, uh, Caitlin has also said model a couple of times. I find it to be a really intimidating word. Caitlin and I were talking about this before, I think Sam chimed in as well, because um, models, you know, there's, there's algorithms, there's math, there's software that I've never seen before in my life. But really what it is, is just a tool. And it's a tool for restoration practitioners and scientists to utilize to their advantage. Um, so that was our whole goal with the CBI was to create a tool that we could use. But we also wanted to incorporate that expert opinion, hence the homework assignment. So in the this sort of center portion, the, the middle picture here, um, you have these crosshatch shaded areas. And these are areas that our experts, um, our stakeholders highlighted as sites that they were personally concerned about, um, completely irrespective of the CBI. Um, so these were areas that either they noticed a 
some ponding or there was vegetation dieback, or maybe the oyster beds weren't where they expected them to be. Just sort of areas that they had on the back burner um, in the back of their mind as sort of sites of potential concern, sites to keep an eye on. Um, and this sort of fed into our CVI output, these, these maps here that you see, um, in two ways, right? We want that expert opinion. Uh, we don't want this to just be a number of layers and a couple of numbers. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but we also wanted to include the people who know this area the, the best. But also, this gave us the opportunity, like Caitlin said, to ground truth or just to prove to ourselves that we were on the right track. So these two cross-hatched areas um, overlap um, areas in red as well as yellow, yellow being sites of intermediate coastal exposure, um, and then red being the highest level of exposure. There's also some segments that intersect with uh, blue areas where there's a little bit of exposure. So this allowed us to kind of retool and refine our model over time. We were also working continuously on two layers that fed directly into this, two really important ones. One was habitat. I have a link to a habitat viewer that I can share in the chat at some point, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and then we were also looking at folk wakes. So the habitat map, um, as Sam mentioned and Caitlin mentioned, really shows us where the habitats are, are doing the most in terms of protecting our, our coast from uh, rising seas, from exposure. And then we also have uh, the influence of, of boat wakes. Boat wakes we know are, are an issue uh, in areas where there's a lot of water, right? I mean, that's why there's no wake zones. Um, so we actually had a senior thesis student in the Chapman lab here at Villanova take on um, the challenge of trying to quantify boat wakes. There's a story map that's linked here, but I'm just going to go through a couple of screenshots real quick. So Phil Yang um, designed, uh, with the help of Greg Rutez and Sam and all of the people at GTM, designed this really clever solution to a really complicated problem, right? So he created this survey that uh, was sent out to uh, resident experts, right? People who are on the estu are on the waters of the estuary, who are up in those tidal channels, people who are on boats all the time. And this allowed um, folks with the most knowledge to rank the boat wakes, the size of boat wakes that they see in different portions of the reserve. So on this left-hand photo, you have different points. And in the colors, we have Shinhai boat wakes, in um, orange, we have knee-high boat wakes, and then in red, we have the highest, which is waist-high boat wakes. So it's a little qualitative, but it really helps us kind of rank things, which is uh, really the basis of how the CBI works. Um, from that survey result, um, using GIS, Phil was then able to interpolate. If you've never used GIS before, interpolate really just allows you to take point data and use a bunch of math and turn it into a surface. Um, so this gives us an idea of continuous boat wakes over the entire intercoastal and those tidal channels as well. This uh, interpolated survey result of boat wakes was then combined with um, AIS boat traffic data, so an idea of how frequently boats are going through the intercoastal and the, um, the tidal creeks, which gave us a heat map, so areas where there are the highest boat wakes and the most frequent boat wakes. And this is what allowed Greg and uh, Phil to rank different channels and sections of the intercoastal and then integrate that directly into the CBI. Um, and as it turns out, boat wakes are, I think, turned out to be one of the uh, most driving variables in terms of determining areas of higher exposure, right? Boat wakes have a, a, pretty, a pretty heavy impact from um, what we've learned from our CBI output. Yeah, and I'll just say that was really great to be able to have an undergraduate student work on that piece of the project, you know, intro introducing that layer into the, the Coastal Vulnerability Index, particularly as, you know, there's good boat wake data for these larger channels like the intercoastal, but on these smaller creeks, it's often harder to get at boat wake data. And so having that in these habitats that are often more pristine or less affected by boat wakes to know what the boat wakes were in those smaller channels is really great. And so um, Phil's written up something pretty good on his how he used this app and was able to distribute to people to actually rank these boat wakes and these small channels for people within the GTM as well as other people out on these waterways, you know, gave us really valuable information, you know, for, by being out there all the time. So if anyone's interested in that, we can share that as well. 
Um, so having the CBI at this point with all these new built layers into it and having had our first workshop, which as Caitlin and Tess said, you know, really identified some of the gaps where we're at with restoration stories in the area, allowed us to plan for our second workshop, which was in February um, of last year. And luckily by that point, we felt comfortable having an in-person um, workshop in which we were able to have a morning in which we were out on the water and looked at a number of sites that we had identified as vulnerable and then bring together people from various um, perspectives and talk about them. And, and what you can see here in this top image is us standing on one of the really most visually arresting things about the wetlands in the GTM reserve, which is these oyster rakes. And so because boat wakes along the intercoastal um, essentially over time dredge up these oyster shells, they build up essentially these walls or hydrological barriers that line a lot of the waterways. In some areas they're breached, in some areas they're not. But as you can imagine, you know, one of our restoration strategies was thinking about hydrological barriers and working in coastal wetlands, we know that, you know, flushing is incredibly key. And so we were able to stand up on one of these rakes um, and talk about the hydrology of one of these vulnerable sites to look at some of these areas of ponding and other things and talk about it from various perspectives, right? We talked to one of the coolest discussions that I had was with someone from mosquito control and thinking about how they are managing these flushing regimes in order to control for mosquitoes and to control for diseases in Florida. You know, another really interesting discussion was talking to a biogeochemist about the sulfides in these areas. You know, we also had discussions with people from the parks department out there and thinking about how these wakes or these rakes can actually, you know, prevent access for kayaks and canoes and things like that. And so really thinking about these hydrological barriers from all kinds of different um, perspectives and then thinking about potential restoration activities and what that might do, for example, to organisms like oyster catchers that actually use these rakes potentially um, for nesting. And so, you know, having all these perspectives from all these different stakeholders is really valuable and was really great about this, you know, field visit that we got to go out on the morning of our second workshop. In the afternoon, we went back to the reserve and were able to sort of process what we had talked about. And Caitlin's gonna give you a little bit more detail on that. But one of the things we did was just have these huge printouts of the CBI maps. And because many of these people are very familiar with these waterways and with these sites, we could go out and say, like, we see this site is showing up as vulnerable, similar to we did in the homework, but more explicitly, and we saw this site today. Do we think this really is vulnerable or not? And what do we think are some of the strategies at that site that might be most useful for restoration? And so um, one of, I just want to kind of make it known that between, um, workshop one, workshop two, we wanted to kind of refine this goal about the CBI, which was actually, again, as Tess said, with the boat wake data with the vulnerable sites, we want to use our model, our tool, as she said, but also really bring in expert opinion and think about where there is overlap and then choose sites from that to get that our um, another part of our first goal, which was actually choosing these sites for field-based investigations of their elevation, of their biomass of the plants and the wetlands, of thinking about the roots um, and kind of going from there. And so I'd love for Caitlin now to tell you a little bit about the, um, some of the activities we did at that afternoon section and morning section of that workshop, because they were really helpful for me and kind of us moving forward from that point. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, as Sam mentioned, these this field conversations that we were able to have out there, um, you know, at a couple of different sites, not only the oyster rake that was there, but also in, you know, very soft, uh, soft, fluffy mud. We had some stakeholders that got stuck in the mud, you know, knee deep, and it was a good opportunity, um, a good relief from COVID experience um, to really talk about those gaps in our knowledge and um, look at the type of field work that was happening out there um, in some of those identified vulnerable sites. And once we got off of the, the boat, we were able to really have continued conversations, um, you know, being able to put 
put eyes on the sites and then uh, and experience the mud and clean off and everything, we were able to continue that workshop um, with a series of presentations from our project team. Um, and then also those map based activities um, where we actually had those large printed out maps and we had sticky notes placed on the tables and we gathered around and we wrote on the maps and scratched areas out and said, well, sometimes it's like this and so and so says it looks like this at this time. Um, and then we had this flip chart activity um, with flip charts throughout the room. And if you have been to facilitated workshops, you probably know the flip charts I'm talking about. But these flip charts had each of those four restoration strategies, the thin layer placement, the berm redistribution, the living shorelines, and um, the mangrove facilitation. Um, but we also had a, a fifth strategy um, that we called the do nothing approach. Um, and so with those strategies, we had the group break into smaller groups and we outlined what are the research and monitoring needs? You know, what do we still need to know about this technique? Um, we looked at management and intervention considerations. What would the outcomes of this technique be considering the evidence from similar studies or similar habitats? Are there considerations that we need to keep in mind, like the vegetation, the tides, the location, elevation equipment, boat wake, monitoring, maintenance, um, access, as Sam mentioned? Um, and then what are some of the implications of this technique that we might not be thinking about? The turbidity, could we be causing a shift in the vegetation community or introducing new invasive species? Um, what does the nutrient addition look like and how can that change this habitat? Are there toxins or metals within the dredged materials that we need to take into consideration? Um, what does this do for the mosquito control um, aspect of this or the changes in the habitat as Sam mentioned for the American oyster catcher. Um, and then even talking about the implications or considerations um, of public perception. Mm -hmm. um, will this make people angry? Um, in Northeast Florida, we have some folks who think that the um, range expansion of mangroves is a range expansion of an invasive species, and they do not want the mangrove to block their view shed. Um, so could we have uh, difficulty with promoting, you know, mangrove facilitation as a strategy? Um, and so being able to put some of these questions and topics out in front of this group of restoration practitioners and stakeholders, we're able to really expand on what do we know and what do we not know? What where do we take these conversations moving forward? Um, I think Sam is going to hit on some of those big themes that really came out of those conversations and that are driving continued efforts. Yeah, just to reiterate, you know, some of the themes that came out of this and kind of have driven our work moving forward um, with this project were, number one, we kind of went over boat wakes. They're seeming to play a large role in this vulnerability. And we talked about the oyster rakes, right, that this hydrological disruption of flushing can really be contributing to this vulnerability that we may not pick up from those layers, but it's something that really needs to be integrated into the CBI and thought about. Um, we talked to some of our great um, collaborators from the Army Corps in thinking about actual feasibility of thin layer placement in parts of the reserve. You know, where were dredge materials available? Where were they not? And it seemed like in some places that wasn't going to be a feasible restoration strategy, which is really great to have their input, although that may not be the case for all the areas um, within the reserve. And Northeast Florida does have some TLP um, potential projects going on. Um, so some other knowledge gaps that came out um, were that we don't know so much about nutrient influences in these wetlands, and that's something I'll talk about um, at the very end, um, and what some of the implications are for other organisms. And then finally, this habitat value that we're able to pull out of the CBI is really important because as we think about wetlands potentially migrating inland, and I know, you know I'm part of efforts and other people are as well, thinking about this migration of wetlands in, those 
habitats have to be in good shape in order for them to be able to migrate inland. And so I think that that's a really important thing that's kind of come out of some of our discussions as well as where is habitat quality high and where is it lower and what could potentially be contributing to their ability to adapt to rising seas. Okay, so Tess is going to talk a little bit quickly. We'll just go over really quickly some of our um, our field data from these sites. Right, yeah. So um, we, after our second workshop, uh, after the slip drive activity, after looking at the CDI as a group, after having a conversation for a good amount of time on this oyster reef, we kept on coming back to this idea, this knowledge gap of what are these berms, what are these oyster reefs doing to the marsh? Or is the, is the marsh behind these oyster reefs hydrologically disrupted. Um, so we decided to keep exploring this because this seemed to be the, the biggest blind spot that we could identify, um, at least as an output of, as an outcome of the, um, the workshops. So we decided to do some field sampling, just some bare bones exploration of the, the basic variables, right? So the image on the right is an overhead of this oyster reef that Sam talked about um, a little bit ago. We took two transects uh, 75 meters in from that oyster rake, so from the oyster rake um, out into the marsh platform toward the uh, tidal channels toward the back. And we measured two major things. We looked at Spartina height, and then we also measured ammonium. And what we found was that at these 15 meter increments that we uh, did these measurements at, Spartina height was taller toward the oyster rake. Um, it dipped down in the center of the marsh platform, and then peaked right back up again near that tidal channel. channel. Um, and this is the same for uh, both transects that we did on either side of this uh, area where the oyster rate was. When we looked at ammonium concentration, we sort of see the uh, opposite pattern here, right? So we have lower ammonium concentration near the oyster rake and um, at the tidal channels in the back, but in the center, we have this peak of ammonium. Um, and ammonium is a biologically available form of nitrogen that plants are readily able to take up and uh, create photosynthetic biomass with. Um, so it begs the question, why is the uh, shorter Spartina in the area where the ammonium is the highest? Um, and we did a, a quick little um, regression that shows indeed that where ammonium is higher, Spartina tends to be shorter. And you would expect that if there's higher ammonium, Spartina should be taking that up. They should be putting on more biomass. They should be taller. So we expect that there's some type of decoupling here between nutrient uptake, um, perhaps uh, due to increased amount of sulfides because of hydrological, hydrological disruption. Um, there could be lower dissolved oxygen. Something's, something's off about this sort of center area of this, of this marsh platform immediately behind the oyster rig, right? So. Um, this has us uh, thinking about sort of what is this, what are these oyster rakes doing to the marsh throughout the GTM, which Sam will touch on in a little bit. Um, but another outcome of this, of, of this project was um, we really wanted to address these knowledge gaps. And we also still wanted to touch back on these other restoration strategies that we started this project with, even though we're sort of exploring uh, land for modification and oyster rigs a little bit more in depth. So this is a, uh, a, a real quick and dirty uh, literature review of these four different uh, restoration strategies. And this is included in that Baru test paper that we keep on harping on. Really, cross your fingers. We really want it to be <laughs> accepted. Um, but this table is really just uh, to address the fact that uh, there's not a lot of um, sort of collated information on restoration strategies what they are, where you can do them, what site requirements you need, but then also knowledge gaps about these different strategies and what we still need to know, what still uh, would be most useful uh, science to inform the practice, right? So just to review the um, goals of the project. So again, our goals were to identify portions of the reserve that are particularly vulnerable to habitat loss. And the outcomes from that were our index model and maps, as well as the field data on these selected vulnerable sites, which were also selected using expert opinion in our second workshop. And then our second goal was to engage land managers and scientists in a new collaboration to start thinking about management options 
for the reserve that could increase elevation or maintain it with respect to rising sea levels. Um, and so that the outcomes of that were our two workshops, this table that Tess just mentioned on, and then we did have a wrap up meeting um, in October, which allowed us to bring everyone back together and review some of these outputs so that we make sure we're kind of like tying off loose ends. Like we did, we said we were gonna do this and we did it and here are some products. And I'll just say that, you know, this has been such a great experience and such a great team of people that we really are taking this to the next step. And so we've been lucky to be funded by the friends of the GTM Reserve to actually take to create a new project that's coming out of this, in particular, this piece, this knowledge gap that we learned about the rakes in these areas, right, that they really are these hydrological issues that are potentially reducing tidal flushing, potentially contributing to sulfide toxicity and root mortality in some of the ponding. And so we're collaborating with um, another crop leader, Lisa Chambers from the University of Central Florida on this work to investigate this further. And in this investigation, the last thing I'll say is that um, another thing that kind of came up in those flip chart activities that Caitlin so beautifully executed um, were these nitrogen concentrations that do tend to be ticking up. And we know that this is happening in the Northeastern United States, as well as in the Gulf in wetlands. And we're starting to see the same things in South in Northeast Florida with increased nutrient concentrations. And we want to know whether these are contributing to some of the vulnerability of marshes or not, right? Maybe they're beneficial in these new, sometimes nutrient limited systems. And so we're trying to work on that as well. And so with that, I'll just, you know, I want to make sure we leave time for questions. Here's mine and Caitlin and Tess's contact information. And I really do want to acknowledge our other collaborators, um, including Nikki Dix and Greg and Bill Young, other collaborators at the reserve um, who have really, as well as all of our workshop participants who are listed on this website here. So thank you. And hopefully we have about 10 minutes for questions. So hopefully that's enough time, Nick. Yeah. I think that is good for time. Um, we have a few questions already that are in the chat, and I don't know if you want to, maybe we can kill the screen share and just have everybody pop on. Do you think that would be better, maybe? Sounds great. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Just a suggestion. All right, gallery view. So uh, we have a few questions that are already in the chat, and I think you already saw them come in, but I can help verbalize some things. So uh, everybody else, with the few minutes we've got left, don't be shy. Throw your questions in the chat. And we can all see them and we can answer them. If we run out of time and there's still some questions left in the chat, we'll just try to get those answered and included in the summary uh, document that has the slides and the Q&A and all that good stuff. So yeah. uh, first question here, given that measuring elevations accurately in squishy coastal environments is technically challenging, have you done a sensitivity analysis to see how sensitive the CWEM model results are to the starting input elevations? That's a really great question by Galen. Um, so a couple of things I'll say about that. So we've measured elevation in these systems using both RTK as well as laser leveling. And we've been lucky enough that the GTM reserve through the swamp data, data monitoring through efforts by Pam Markham um, and others have these great SETs that have been in place for a while, which are we can tie into our sites as well. And so we've actually looked at the QEM model results in juxtaposition with those SET data to try to see kind of as you're suggesting um, with the sensitivity, not necessarily to the starting elevations, but we did do a sensitivity analysis in QEM by itself. And it turns out that the model is most sensitive to actually to processes such as root turnover. And so as you can imagine, these systems, while they are impacted by sediments, are very organically driven as well. And so we really were very careful to get our root measurements right. And we ourselves measured a lot of root turnover as well as collected data um, from other sites and things to get that right. So that's a great question. And hopefully I answered that for you. We feel pretty good about some of the sensitivity analyses that we did with the QEM model. Um, but it is challenging for sure to be measuring um, elevation in these systems. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, are you exploring restoration work to curb mangrove migration or encroachment into emergent tidal wetland habitat? Will this migration help build overall tidal wetland resiliency to sea level rise? Lots of ecosystem service trade-off, I imagine they put that part in parentheses. Yeah, that's also a great question. Um, so there's a couple of things, as you can imagine here, there's been some really great work. I think I saw Anna's on the call by people in her group um, down the Gulf thinking about 
habitat trade-offs with mangroves encroaching into marshes. There's also been some great work down there, as well as in parts of Florida on that's ongoing on the recent freezes, because as you can imagine, as mangroves encroach, if there is some deep freeze events, like there has been with these recent polar vortices, you know, what does that mean? The mangroves come in and then they get killed off. So what we've seen so far, and we have a paper that just came out on a freeze event that happened at one of our sites, is that our, the freeze events that we've seen so far, the Abyssinia at least has been pretty resilient to them and have re-sprouted, but I know that's not the case in all sites. And so thinking about, you know, mangroves in these areas as an actual restoration strategy, you know, I think it's worth thinking about, even though, um, you know, there are some, some drawbacks to that. These mangroves at one site that we work at where our warming chambers are in five years, it went from tiny mangroves to big mangroves, <laughs> almost, you know, going to be hundred percent cover soon. And so, you know, we're measuring elevation in those, in those places to really figure out whether the elevation as well as some of the storm surge protection is increased with those mangroves. But as you can imagine, there's all kinds of ethical and as you said, ecosystem trade-offs. So um, I don't have a definitive answer for you. That's really a management question and one that we're hopefully going to be talking about in a few weeks um, at a workshop that we're doing um, at the reserve that's been organized by, by Caitlin and other people. Caitlin, do you want to say something about that? Sure. And I think that it also um, hits on Randy's question about what's next with the restoration strategies. And ironically, the workshop that we're hosting here in a couple of weeks is called What's Next, um, a coastal wetlands workshop. And it is a neuroscience collaborative capacity building grant that we've received. And we will be um, you know, some of you on on this call are, have been invited to join us at the reserve for a four day workshop to really look at all of the research and the data that's been pulled from collaborative projects like SAMS um, to determine really management wise, what should the reserve do next? Um, what type of data is there that we still need to collect um, or what, who else we should be partnering with to kind of hit at some of these questions. And at the end of this workshop, our goal is to have a prioritized list of um, of the next steps, whether it is a ready to go grant proposal for the next funding opportunity that presents itself, um, or is are we ready to start taking action? Um, and we really want to have the um, the expertise of some of those subject matter experts like Sam, like Tess, um, and some of you on, on the line who are familiar with these strategies or will be able to help give some direction. So um, hang tight as far as the, the true what's next. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to give some guidance um, in, the, in the future. And the next and question I'll I see Nick, is um, yeah. how extensive are, are the other wetlands outside the reserve that these findings apply to? So that's a great question, you know, and it's something that I've worked in other ports of Florida primarily um, in these wetlands. And I'll say that um, they are they are similar to some of the wetlands we've been working a little bit further north to capturing things like roots and other things a little bit north. You know, I. I don't think that these are vastly different than other parts of the East Coast wetlands, although of course hydrology can be different in some of these rakes and are more or less prevalent in other places. But you know, it's hard to say. I know that in these microtidal systems further south in Florida, it's very different, right? There's sandier soils and there's different, you know, drivers of elevation, sometimes more biogen biogenic. So I think. I think in some places these can be um, relevant. Like Tess said in that table, you know, some places there's there's kind of like site descriptions of where this could be relevant or not, which mm -hmm. I think was something that really important that came out of our our workshops was to how that how do you how can you scale this or not? Mm -hmm. Sorry to cut you off, G. She was going to ask you that question, I think. So cool. all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are about out of time. Uh, if anybody does have any more questions, they want to extend to the presenters, you can feel free to send them either to me via email or put them in the exit survey, which will go out, I think, as soon as you close the session, but it'll also go out tomorrow via email. I double checked. So there's a link to a survey this time. <laughs> so you'll get it. You should get it. Um, 
I just want to say a big thank you to our presenters for taking the time to be with us today and putting together a great presentation. Thank you all for spending time with us. I know it's a lot to add one more virtual thing to your calendar, so thank you for choosing us. <laughs> um, recording will be available in the next few days as soon as I get around to editing it and making sure that there are timestamps and the appropriate links and things. So again, thank you, everybody, and everyone have a great day. Thanks for the great questions. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Donald. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, folks.